All right. Here is our problem for the day. We have the number uh, model for the number of hours of daylight in San Diego. Last time we did an hours of daylight problem, it was in Grand Rapids, Michigan. It's getting a little bit cold out there. So I moved the problem to a warmer climate. So the number of hours of daylight in San Diego on day T of the year is given by this function, 12 plus 2.4 sine of 0 0.017 T minus 1.377. Slightly different format. Normally we have the B multiplied by the difference between C, uh, uh, the T and the horizontal shift. But here, it looks like we've distributed the B. So we have that one linear function in there. So that's gonna change a little bit our analysis of the order of operations for this problem. Instead of the first thing being subtraction, the first thing is gonna be multiplying by the number B and then we'll subtract by what presumably must be B times C. Then we do sine, then we multiply by 2.4, then we add the 12. Before we do that, let's take a look at what this function is trying to represent and what these numbers mean in this context. So just based on what we normally have, uh, it looks like we've got a 12 plus 2.4, and that's the vertical stuff. 12 is the constant. And so that's going to be where our middle is. So our middle is going to be at a 12. Oh, we're, let's draw our sine function. We have, let's see, halfway. So if we draw a sine function, all these numbers have to mean something. That 12 is the constant. That's going to locate the middle of our graph. So the 12 is gonna take place, is gonna be here at the middle. Let's take a look at each of these numbers and see if they make sense. So the mid is at 12. This is representing the 12 hours specifically. This is supposed to represent the number of hours of daylight. It should make sense that in the middle, there's gonna be 12 hours of daylight. And then we'll either have more than that or less than that. Things have been rounded off. Uh, we know San Diego is a little bit above the equator, so it might not be evenly split with the amount of time it has above 12 hours and below 12 hours, but we're just creating a model. And so it seems reasonable to put the middle at 12 hours. It's kind of like in, when you take your physics class, you're going to ignore friction and air resistance. So you're just gonna make sure that your problems, objects are going slow enough that air resistance isn't an issue. And friction just complicates things. So break out the WD-40. And the reason that you do that is you're trying to learn physics and you gotta start somewhere. Friction, adding friction and air resistance complicates the problem. So let's take that out and go with something simpler and insert a simpler problem that we can expand on later. Same kind of thing going on here. The middle might not be 12 hours because we're not sitting on the equator. So we're gonna move it to 12 hours anyway. I suppose I could have just erased the San Diego part and said at some undisclosed location. But let's see what else, what other numbers we have. We've got an amplitude of 2.4. So that means the difference in the number of hours, the amplitude is 2.4. That's the distance from the middle to the top. And so that'll tell us where the top and the bottom of the graph is. 12 plus the 2.4 is gonna be 14.4 hours. 
and 12 minus 2.4 is uh, 10 point, uh, to 9.6. Yeah, 10 point uh, negative four, negative point four. So these numbers mean something. Apparently in San Diego, we have, we get at most 14.4 hours of daylight and at least 9.6 hours of daylight. All right. And then our average. Just thinking about this problem, um, uh, the question, for the further question says, what days are there more than 14 hours of daylight? So we're going to be looking for, oops, we're going to be looking, so the top is at 14.4. We're going to look for where I'm going to draw a 14 and figure out where those two points are. So it makes sense that'll be between which two days. That's going to be when we're solving the equation. We're going to take uh, a, do a sine inverse and then put the, that sine inverse in the two quadrants. Make sure we put those in the two quadrants. All right. Let's see. Uh, other pieces of information. We should expect that the period of this function should be 365 days, it should be one year. So just based on what the function is trying to model, we expect that the period should be one year. Since T is measuring things in days, it should be 365 days. So that means that the number in the, um, the coefficient of T, I think I was using blue for that and not green. Well, I'm using green now. So the value of B should be two pi divided by 365. Let's see what that's equal to. See, two pi divided by 365 days is point zero, uh, point zero one seven two. So that looks like what we're using for our coefficients. I remember this book had a whole section on significant figures, and then it just like kind of kind of tossed that it's like all two, 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 four, for some reason. Actually, it's four here because of the 0 0.017. It's less about the significant figures and more about the decimal points. But this leading zero is really mucking things up because that two might make a difference. If we just did uh, two pi divided by 0 0.017, So 0 0.0172 gives us a, a period of 365.3, 3, which is a little bit too much. But if we do two pi divided by uh, 0 0.017, just that part, we get a, a period of 369.6 days. So it seems like rounding off to 0 0.017 is a little bit inappropriate because it's gonna put us off the number of days that we wanted. I don't know, maybe we want it to be longer. There's astronomical stuff going on here, maybe that I just don't understand. All right. So it makes sense that we, it, it looks like we can see all the things that we need to see, except this uh, point 0 0.017 has been multiplied through. Normally we have the B factored out, 
normally we have it looking like B times T minus, um, I think I called that C. Normally it looks like B times T minus C. So the point 1377 or 1.377 is not just the horizontal shift, it's the horizontal shift multiplied by the coefficient of T. So if I want to rewrite this expression with the B factored out, I'll just take the 1.377 and divide it by the 0 0.017. And then that will be my horizontal shift, 81. And so it looks like this graph, they chose to have the starting, it's a pot with positive sign, we're starting here when T is equal to 81. Uh, let's see, let me look up, oh, I closed it. Why did I do such a thing? Um, The 81st day of the year is March 22nd. So here are the observations that we're that we've made. The point 017 gives us a period of 369.6 days. So with a point 0172, we would have had a period of 365. But with B equal to 0 0.017 tells us that the period is 2 pi divided by 0 0.017 or 369.6 days. So know that we're working with a period that's a little bit longer. But that tells us some things. That means that a quarter of the period based on this function up here. I didn't leave something off. Nope. Uh, based on this function up here, one quarter of the period is gonna be the 369.6 divided by four. or 92.4. So if I take the 81 and add the 92.4, so our starting 81 plus the 92.4, one quarter of the period. We'll put us at 173. Point four, and that will be one quarter period after the middle. That will put us at our maximum daylight hours on the 173rd day, which is June 22nd. So, that tracks. If we add up <clears throat> uh, another um, 92.4, that'll put us at the middle again at 265.8, call it 266. 
And then if we add another one, this down here will happen at 358. And day 358 is December 24th. Seems close. That tracks. So it looks like even with this extended period going around some round off error, we seem to be okay. It fits with our intuition of how things are supposed to work. Sometime in June, we should have our longest day. Sometime in December, we'll have our shortest day. Middle days in the middle. Any questions? So we've seen some things here. We uh, looked at that the, the vertical shift and the amplitude to figure out our maximum and minimum hours of daylight. We looked at the coefficient of T to figure out what we're using for a period. <clears throat> we can see where the point 017 came from. It looks like it's been rounded from the point 0172 because we expect the period to be like 365, but our period at point 017 is gonna be 369.6. But everything seems to fit pretty well. Our maximum amount of daylight will occur on June 22nd, and our minimum amount of daylight will occur on December 24th. That fits. I got the 81 by looking up a table, um, or the 81 came from the 1.377 and dividing it by 0 0.017. So I wanted to write, I wanted to see what the horizontal shift was. The horizontal shift requires us to have the form B times the quantity T minus C or theta minus C. So the point one three, uh, one, the 1 1.377 is with B multiplied by C. So I took C divided by B. I took the 1.377 and divided it by the 0 0.017. So that's how I factored out the point 017 from the 1.377. This is just like if I had an expression, or um, just like if I had an expression that was 2x plus 10, I can factor a 2 out and that'll leave an x plus 5. And the 5 comes from 10 divided by 2. So I factored out 0 0.017. That means I had to divide the 1.377 by the 0 0.017. That's where the 81 came from. Any other questions? All right, so this is just looking at the equation and what the equation is trying to tell us in context, We're making sure our intuition about this equation will fit with our intuition about what it's supposed to model. Always an important step. So many students uh, say, oh, I don't, like, um, I don't like application problems. But application problems are better because you get an answer and the answer has to make sense in the context. You have context to see if it makes sense. If you're calculating the length of the runway and it comes out to 15 feet and you're trying to calculate the length of a runway for a 747, you're gonna be a little bit off there with 15 feet. Something has gone horribly wrong. But if you got a generic equation with no context whatsoever, sure you got a mechanical way to check if your answer is correct, but It doesn't pass, it doesn't have an, a built-in reality check. If we plug something in here and we got the number of daylight, uh, the hours of daylight is negative seven, something has gone horribly wrong. It doesn't, negative seven doesn't pass the reality check for a number of hours of daylight. 
So by setting things up this way and making sure we read everything that's going on in the equation, we can also see if we're asking some unreasonable questions. On what day of the year will there be only eight hours of daylight? And apparently that won't happen here. According to this model, the minimum number of hours of daylight in San Diego is 9.6 hours. Any questions? All right. Let's look at the problem. The problem was about an equation. It says, between what days are there more than 14 hours of daylight? So now that we have a sketch, we can see what we're looking for. The, this 14 hours of daylight will be, will break off one of these pieces where we have maximum daylight. So we're looking for some time in the summer. And we know we're looking for two values. It makes sense because we know mechanically we're going to be solving a trigonometric equation. We're going to have to do a sine inverse at one point, which means using a calculator to find the reference angle and then putting the reference angle in the appropriate quadrants. It looks like we're going to be putting that reference angle in quadrant one and quadrant two because sine is going to be positive. So it fits mechanically with what we know we're going to be do to so doing to solve the equation and it fits in the context of the problem. So that's why we like application problems so much. They have to fit. Let's solve the equation. Now, a bunch of things have, oops, I just moved the thing that I wanted to look at. We wanna write down the things that are happening to T. We wanna write down an order of operations that turn T into a 14, so that we can turn 14 back into a T. So let's write those down. The first thing that happens to T, so T turns into 14. Remember this part happens in your mind. So let's think it, and then let's see if we wrote what we thought. The first thing that happens to the T is we multiply by 0 0.017. The second thing that happens to T is we subtract the 1.377. After we subtract the 1.377, we apply the sign of the results. After we take the sign of the result, we multiply by 2.4. And then finally, we add 12. We're just reading the equation and seeing what, or reading the function, and seeing what this does to a T, all the different things that it does to a T. This is what happened to turn T into a 14. We multiplied by 0 0.017. We then subtracted 1.377, then we took the sign, multiplied by 2.4, and then added 12. So to turn 14 back into a T, our plan to, to turn 14 back into T, we just do inverse operations in reverse order. First, we'll subtract 12. Second, we'll divide by 2.4. Third, we'll do the sine inverse thing. Remember that involves three steps, reference angle, quadrants, all the solutions. That third step in this case is gonna be optional because this just repeats after every year. But there's three steps in that sine inverse process. And then fourth, we can add 1.377. And finally, we'll divide by 0 0.017. Here we are with inverse operations in reverse order.
this is going to this is what's taking place in our mind just by reading the question so this is all stuff that we're just thinking it took a long time to write but remember this is just taking place in our mind we're just thinking it And then we grab our calculator and do these things. There, there's a place that where the problem splits. That third step, the problem is going to split. We're going to have to find the reference angle and put that into each of the two quadrants. Put it into the two appropriate quadrants. So conveniently, I ran out of space. I, I don't know why I thought I would fit this in here. Maybe I will because it's taking place on our calculator. So we're gonna start with 14 and first we're gonna subtract 12. That's gonna give us a two. We'll divide this by 2.4, 0.833. We were gonna, I was about to hit sine inverse, but then I remembered my calculator might be in degrees. And since T met is the number of hours, we're gonna to wanna to switch our mode to radians. Degrees is only for angles. Radians is for when we're dealing with uh, real numbers. Now I can do the sine inverse of the 0.83 and 0.985. That's the reference angle that's gonna to have to go in quadrants one and quadrants two. So now I am gonna to have to make a note. My reference angle from three our T reference is 0.985 in quadrants one and quadrant two, because that's where sine is positive. So the 0.985 in quadrant one is just 0.985, that's convenient. So I'll do the next step, which is to, to add 1.377. and finally divide by 0 0.017. And so we get a T of 138.9. We'll just call it 139. Now I'm gonna need that 0.985 again, and I'm gonna have to put it in quadrant two. That's gonna be my reference angle in quadrant one, which was just 0.985. And I'm gonna to need to put it in quadrant two. So the T in quadrant two is gonna be 180 minus this 0.985. But I can't use 180 because I'm in radians. 180 is pi radians minus the 0.985. So that's gonna be 2.15 seven. And then that's going to give us different values. Now I'm going to take the 2.157. Then I'm going to do the plus 1.377. And then I'll divide this by the 0 So it looks like between day 139 and day 208, we will uh, have more than 14 hours of daylight in San Diego. So once the problem splits into two answers with that sine inverse, that's when we had to proceed with two answers for anything that comes after. I had to do the 1.377 to both of those. And I had to divide by the 0 0.017, both of them. because so I had the Q1. In Q1, we just got to use 0.985. And in Q2, we had to have the 2.157. Both of those had to go through the next two steps.
Once we put a reference angle into the two different quadrants, we have two answers and we have stuff that still happens. <clears throat> and we got to know when those that splits in two. So it looks like between Tays 139 and 208, we will have more than 14 hours of daylight. If I plug 139 into this function, just to make sure everything works, I'm gonna check my answer. I'm gonna take the 139, I'm going to multiply by 0 0.017, subtract 1.377, find the sine of this number, then multiply by 2.4 and then add 12. And that lands us at 13.5, which means I may have rounded things off too much. Let's see. So let's run the 0.985, add the 1.377, and then divide by 0 0.017. 138.9. Let's run that through. Let's do 138 times 0 0.017 minus 1.377, sine of that, times 2.4 plus 12. 13.97, looks like I needed one more decimal point. If I had to guess, it came down to that 0 0.017 rather than 0 0.0172. Let's try that with the 208. And run 208 through this function, times 0 0.017 minus 1.377. The sine of that times 2.4 and plus 12. That one came out closer. I think I rounded the 208 off a lot less than we rounded off because the 139, that was like 138.5. So it was right in the middle. But I think the 208 had, didn't have as far to go. Any questions? There's nothing here that's really new going on in solving the equations. It might be new, this inverse, the way that I phrase things where I say inverse operations in reverse order, where I write down what happened to the variable and then write down the inverse functions. That might be a new um, description of what you're doing. But I promise you, this is just what you were doing when you were solving equations before. Whenever you were solving an equation, you say, and you told yourself to do the same thing to both sides of the equation, this is what you were doing. I'm just trying to make more explicit how you make the decision about what to do next to both sides of the equation. In addition to that, in this kind of new framing, in addition to that, we had this new inverse operation show up. And that involved some extra stuff. This trig, uh, inverse trig functions involves finding a reference angle and putting that reference angle into the appropriate quadrants. And if we're looking for all the solutions, adding multiple integer multiples of the period to both of them. The structure of the problem told us, don't worry about all the solutions, just worry about those first two. Just worry about the ones in that, one, in that first period. Any questions? How's everybody okay? Everybody looks stunned. So like I said, this is not really a new process. We just have to remember, uh, we just have to remember when our functions aren't invertible there might be some extra stuff. If you're thinking about, well, that's brand new. I assure you it is not because we've solved quadratic equations before and those have two solutions. So for example, 
If I want to solve the equation x squared is equal to 9, we know that there are two solutions, 3 and negative 3. Because if we think about how x got turned into a 9, only one thing happened. We raise it to the second power. So our plan turning 9 back into x, we know that we need to do a square root. But a square root splits the problem into two, just like the quadrant thing with the trigonometric functions. So this leads, this produces two. This is where the two solutions appear, one positive and one negative. So if there are other things that are going on with our equation, so if I look at a modification of this, instead of x squared equals nine, I have x minus um, five squared equals nine. Then what turns an x into nine is first we subtract five and then we raise to the second power. So our plan to turn nine back into an X, first, we're gonna do a square root. That's gonna produce two answers or two solutions. Then we'll have to do the plus five to both of them. So the square roots, because even exponents don't respect negative numbers, the square roots, Two solutions appear. And so we have to do the plus five to both of them. The plus five means we'll have to do plus five to both of them. So the square root of nine is not just three, it's three and negative three. Specifically, the square root of nine is three. The solutions to x squared equals nine are three and negative three. So we get two solutions, three and negative three, and we have to add five to both of them. Three plus five is eight, and negative three plus five is two. Eight minus five is three squared is nine. 2 minus 5 is negative 3 squared, which is also 9. If there are operations that appear before the squaring, then we don't have to do both of those because they happen before the two solutions appear. So for example, if I've got x minus 5 squared is equal to, um, oops, let's say, plus uh, ooh, six, I guess, yeah, six is fine, is equal to nine. Then the things that turn X into a nine here, first we subtract five like before, second we raise the second power like before, but there's a third step where we add six. So when we turn nine back into X, first, we're gonna to have to subtract six. That's not, we're not gonna do that to both solutions because there aren't both solutions yet. In the second step, two solutions appear because we do a square root and even exponents don't respect negative numbers. So here, two solutions appear. one positive and one negative. And then to both of those solutions, we still have to do the plus five. So the third step, we do a plus five, and this has to be done to both. So we would take the nine, nine minus six is three. Nine minus six is three. We take the square roots, uh, positive square root of three, 
and negative square root of three, and we have to add five to both. So our solutions are five plus the square root of three and five minus the square root of three. But nine minus six, that's just three. The two solutions don't appear until the square root thing shows up. Just like with a trig function, the two solutions don't appear until we get to the, square, uh, to the sine inverse and have to put that into two different quadrants. Any questions? Now remember this inverse operations in reverse order business only works when the variable only appears once. If we've got all kinds of combinations of X's, then we're gonna to have to do other things. If it's quadratic, then we write it in the vertex form. We complete the square so that the variable only appears once. So when we have quadratic functions, we have a, a strategy for this. AX squared plus BX plus C equals zero. We rewrite the, ver the AX squared plus BX plus C it, with the, um, by completing the square. And so we rewrite this in the form A times X minus H squared plus K equals zero. And now we can do inverse operations in reverse order. Look at the order of operations here to turn x into a zero. First, we subtract h. Second order of operations says the exponent goes next. Third, we are multiplied by a. And fourth, we will add k. So to turn a zero back into an x, our plan will be first to subtract k. Second, divide by a, third, do a square root, that's gonna to lead to two answers. Oh, dang it. Zero minus k is minus k, divided by a, square root, that's gonna to lead to two answers. And then fourth, we have to add H. H plus or minus the square root of minus K over A. Now you might be thinking to yourself, dude, why don't we just use the quadratic formula? If you're gonna write down the quadratic formula, you are completing the square. The quadratic formula is the punchline to completing the square. You're just cheating yourself out of understanding what uh, the symmetry of parabolas, how H is in the middle, and then we have plus or minus the same amount because of the symmetry. You don't get to know that because you want to go right to the answer. You're like, oh, complete the square. That's crazy. Up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, B, A, square. You forget understanding stuff. Just go right to the end. So you don't get to be like all pro quadratic formula and anti completing the square because the quadratic formula is completing the square. If you think back to quadratic functions, what is H after all? The opposite of B over 2A. And we can use the rest of this to figure out what is in here. I don't actually don't want to reverse engineer it right now. Any questions? Comments? Replans? Remember that the 
This is going to be a parabola. I'm just going to assume that the parabola opens up because it doesn't matter. If you want the parabola to open down, just turn the paper upside down. The vertex is here at H K. That means this vertical line through the vertex is where X is equal to H. And we're looking for these two values. There's a plus the square root, and here's your minus the square root for your two zeros. I'm pointing this out because a similar thing happens when you're solving trigonometric equations. You find the reference angle and you put the reference angle into the appropriate quadrants. That's where the problem splits into two. It's just not necessarily going to be a plus or a minus. Any questions? Comments? How's everybody okay? Everybody looks stunned. That's why, that's why I have to ask. Actually, I'm only pretending you all look stunned. It's just, it's just hard to tell video wise. Plus only like half of, you is, half, half of you are even logged in. And usually with like 40 people in the class and 20 people logged in, like four of those are actually watching the proceedings. The rest have me muted and have, have Netflix on them, the other screen. You know what I mean? This is not me arguing. This is not me saying we should be back in class because if we were back in the classroom, it would be the same thing. There'd be 40 people in the, enrolled, 20 people in the room, and like four of them would just be not watching Netflix. You'd be like taking notes on your computer. I take notes on my computer. And they'd be like, oh, what's your keyboard shortcut for square roots? And you'd be like, oh, uh, I go, that's right, you're watching Netflix. Just be honest with yourself. And admit, at least admit to yourself that you're not paying attention. You know what I mean? I usually tell my students, I don't care if you lie to me. It's totally okay to lie to me. That's part of the whole dynamic. I'm the teacher. You're the student. You're going to be going, oh, leech, I'm so sick. Ooh. And I go, oh, my gosh, feel better. Then you know, the student will be like, oh, I have a doctor's note. So I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not into any HIPAA violations. So don't, I don't need to know. I'm just gonna treat you like an adult and say, oh my gosh, feel better. See you on Thursday. Then you'd be like, oh, no, nah, it's a 36 hour thing. I'm like, all right, I'll see you on Tuesday. Have a good weekend. Get better. You know what I mean? Anyway. So what we're talking about? Oh yeah, students not going to class. If we were in person, it's the same kind of thing. Students are like, oh, I'm taking notes on my computer. And really you just have your hands in front of you going like this and Netflix is on and you're just watching Netflix with your fingers for some reason. You know what I mean? At least, you know, bring headphones. <laughs> yes, you would never, would never watch Netflix in class. It's, it's Disney plus. So yes, correct. Disney Plus is much more appropriate. I think it depends on the math class though. I think if it was linear algebra, Netflix would be the correct answer. Like Disney just wouldn't fit. You know what I mean? So. Any questions? I'm hoping that this pandemic will kind of put an end to that kind of behavior because I don't want people to go, because like so many people will commute to work just to not work. If you don't need to be there, your company shouldn't require that you be there. You know what I mean? So anyway, I guess this all comes back to people keep saying things like things get back to normal. And I don't want things to go back to normal. Back to normal is what got us here. Not necessarily working from home and adjustment to the pandemic and all that other kind of stuff, but what got us here where we're all in our individual little information silos 
burning up too much electricity and destroying the planet for a bunch of people that aren't doing those things. You know what I mean? It's not so much, it, it, I'd, I'd be, be okay with humanity ruining the planet if we were all ruining the planet kind of equally, but really it's just like industrialized nations ruining it for everybody else. And the people that are gonna suffer the most are the ones that pretty much aren't doing those things. The people that aren't ruining the planet, they're the first ones to go. That's messed up. If we were all equally gonna die at the same time and we were all equally ruining the planet at the same rate, I'd kind of be like, okay, we screwed up. I hope the next, the next species does better than we do because we certainly did bad. But the fact is we're ruining it for other people. You know what I mean? What are we talking about? Oh yeah, solving equations. All right, that's gonna do it for today. Think about solving equations. Um, the book and I disagree about what are good problems, but I'm gonna use the book problems anyway. And we're gonna see what we get out of those problems because it, it will bring up some interesting questions. Uh, I have a quick question. Yes. Have our next assignments already been posted? Uh, they have not. I've been trying to decide which problems to do. They're going to be from chapter six, though, for those of you reading along in the book. Actually, they're going to be from chapter six, whether you're reading along in the book or not, because chapter six is where we have solving trigonometric equations. I like to start solving equations before we start doing identities. I don't know why that is. It's just the way that it all goes together in my mind because I like to get the basic maneuver first to this inverse trig function, find the reference angle, put the reference angle in the appropriate quadrants, and then move on from there. I like that to go first as our core competency, and then using identities to get to that, that space, that's kind of like the niche thing. That's like the weirdo thing that we'll have to do. That's the extra. I don't think we should start with the extra stuff first. It's weird. And oh, it just it doesn't make any sense story-wise. Pedagogically, it's fine. It doesn't make any sense story-wise. So anyway, that's gonna do it for today. We're gonna have, things are gonna be a little bit weird. We're gonna have some homework from chapter six to solve some equations. And then we're gonna come back and grab some trigonometric identities. And then we're gonna start using those in solving equations. So kind of mix them all together. That's going to do it for today. I will see y'all on Thursday. Everybody have a good couple of days. And thanks for playing. Thank you.